Welcome back to Love Letters and Mixtapes. I am so glad you're here. This is a weekly podcast with new episodes available every Monday morning. And the inspiration for this podcast was a desire to write, share, and talk about things that our younger selves needed to hear, whether that was 30 years ago, three years ago, or yesterday. After you listen to this episode, please make sure to subscribe on your favorite listening platform. You can also rate it, review it, or share it with friends. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider sponsoring this podcast with a small monthly donation by clicking the link in my Instagram bio at Love Letters and Mixtapes. I'd like to take a moment to thank the sponsor of this podcast. Snake River Roasting Company is an organic coffee roaster located in the beautiful mountains of Jackson Hole, Wyoming. And not only do they roast award-winning coffees, but their mission and commitment to supporting the rights of women farmers around the world are just incredible. This morning, I started my day with a cup of their Wild Iris Organic Coffee Blend. And if you're ready to fall in love with your coffee, Snake River Roasting Company has a free shipping code for you to give their delicious coffee a taste. Head to their website, snakeriverroastingco.com, and use the code COFFEELOVE at checkout for free shipping on all domestic coffee orders. This episode is brought to you by the Weather Channel app. Did you know the app can help you forecast more than just the weather? With allergy tracking and flu risk mapping. So you know when to stay inside and load up on podcast, As well as air quality and UV indexing. So you know when to get outside, load up on sunscreen and podcast. Forecast more of what you love with the Weather Channel app. Apple Gift Card is a practical gift that unlocks a world of entertainment and fun. You can send it via email or give a physical card to your loved ones. Your friends and family can spend it on their favorite Apple services, including Apple subscriptions. Apple Gift Card can be used to buy all things Apple. Products, accessories, apps, games, movies, TV shows, iCloud Plus, and more. Visit apple.com for details and to send Apple Gift Cards to your friends and family this holiday season. So this week, I wanted to talk about fear and all the different stories that it tells us. And I know that for so many of us, just hearing the word fear can make us recoil or bristle. It's almost as if we are programmed to not recognize or admit that we're afraid of anything. And whether that was modeled for us growing up or something that has been reinforced by societal messages or if we were just straight out told to not admit that we were afraid of anything because that would make us look weak or vulnerable. You know, if that's you, I'm going to encourage you to stick around for this episode, to lean into the discomfort of this topic, and trust that even if you finish this episode and still say to yourself that you're not afraid of anything, You just might have a better understanding of the people in your life who are currently struggling with their own stories of fear. And so I always like to take that position whenever I'm learning something new or hearing about something new. It doesn't have to automatically and immediately resonate with me because everything is grist for the mill. Everything is something that we can probably use somewhere down the line, even if we can't quite see it yet. So taking that initial position of curiosity instead of certainty and just being open to maybe hearing a different perspective and allowing that to either align with you or open up some empathy within you for other people is a great first step as we start doing some of this work for ourselves. And before I really begin to dive into this topic this week, I wanted to share a short excerpt that perfectly describes our very challenging and baffling relationships with fear. And this excerpt is from John Irving's book, The World According to Garp. Duncan began talking about Walt and the Undertow, a famous family story. For as far back as Duncan could remember, the Garps had gone every summer to Dog's Head Harbor, New Hampshire, where the miles of beach in front of Jenny Fields' estate were ravaged by a fearful undertow. When Walt was old enough to venture near the water, Duncan said to him, 
as Helen and Garp had for years said to Duncan, watch out for the undertow. Walt retreated respectfully, and for three summers, Walt was warned about the undertow. Duncan recalled all the phrases. The undertow is bad today. The undertow is strong today. The undertow is wicked today. Wicked was a big word in New Hampshire, not just for the undertow. And for years, Walt reached out for it. From the first, when he asked what it could do to you, he had only been told that it could pull you out to sea. It could suck you under and drown you and drag you away. It was Walt's fourth summer at Dog's Head Harbor, Duncan remembered, when Garp and Helen and Duncan observed Walt watching the sea. He stood ankle deep in the foam from the surf and peered into the waves without taking a step for the longest time. The family went down to the water's edge to have a word with him. What are you doing, Walt? Helen asked. What are you looking for, dummy? Duncan asked him. I'm trying to see the undertoad, Walt said. The what, said Garp? The undertoad, Walt said. I'm trying to see it. How big is it? And Garp and Helen and Duncan held their breath. They realized that all these years, Walt had been dreading a giant toad lurking offshore, waiting to suck him under and drag him out to sea. The terrible undertoad. Garp tried to imagine it with him. Would it ever surface? Did it ever float? Or was it always down under, slimy and bloated, and ever watchful for ankles its coated tongue could snare? The vile undertoad. Between Helen and Garp, the undertoad became their code phrase for anxiety. Long after the monster was clarified for Walt, undertow dummy, not undertoad, Duncan had howled. Garp and Helen evoked the beast as a way of referring to their own sense of danger. When the traffic was heavy, when the road was icy, when depression had moved in overnight, they said to each other, the undertow is strong today. Remember, Duncan asked on the plane, how Walt asked if it was green or brown? Both Garp and Duncan laughed, but it was neither green or brown. Garp thought, it was me, it was Helen, it was the color of bad weather, it was the size of an automobile. That is one of my favorite books for so many reasons. But one of the main reasons is that it shares stories of real love, like realistic love, love that changes over time, love that gets lost, love that gets found again, it gets broken into pieces, and it repairs itself through things that we think we could never forgive. So that's my little book recommendation for the week. Definitely pick up The World According to Garp. And The reason that I wanted to share that specific quote is the way that it touches on fear in such a wraparound way. We see fear through a child's eyes, and we see how it distorts our perception and how communication is so important, and an understanding of each of our individual frames of reference is really important when we're talking about fear. Because we see how something as benign and beautiful as waves on the beach in summer can cause so much fear inside of us when we believe something is just waiting to get us. And we also see how, as adults, it can become our secret language with loved ones. Even how some of our partners can hear our story winding up in our heads sometimes before we can. And I love that one line, the undertoad is strong today. It just sums up so much just about fears, the distortion of fears, and 
those wild stories that we tell ourselves and that we don't really question once they take root. Because Walt was really young when he's first told the story, and even as he ages, the story is cemented in his brain, even though now he has a better frame of reference. Like he knows that toads don't live in the ocean, but because his fear is so strong and it has taken such deep root, he never questions it. So maybe take a moment and think about your own life, your secret fears, all of those anxieties that you would never tell another person, and the ones that are at times distorted beyond recognition, and how these fears can alter our perception of ourselves or others and impact our decision-making. So just pause and think, how often is fear shaping and directing our lives and our relationships? I shared this excerpt with a friend a few weeks ago as I was attempting to explain how I've been feeling lately as I trudge through some uncomfortable feelings around change and uncertainty in my own life. And there's this renewed awareness that I have around some of my own deep-rooted fears that are rising to the surface. And the story that these fears are telling me is that things are just not going to be okay, that there's no way that anything is going to turn out in my favor, almost as if I'm in danger, with no evidence to support that. And my friend summed it up perfectly in his reply because he said, the unknown is scary, especially when you think it's something else. And how often do we all do that? Here I am at the crossroads on the precipice of big changes, and all I can do is imagine the worst case scenario at every turn. And the story that I'm telling myself about uncertainty is one of punishment, loss, and suffering. And I have no evidence to support this story at all, but I've noticed how I've allowed my distorted perception and my fear to take me out of the present, simply because I think the unknown is something else. And I know that there is a temptation when we hear someone else share something like that about themselves, like I've just shared about sort of what I'm going through, that something in us wants to separate ourselves from what this other person has said. We want to make sure that there is no part of us that resonates or feels seen or heard because it's scary when someone puts words to how we're feeling or gets to our feelings before we're ready to. So instead of doing that, instead of pushing those things away, I'm going to invite and encourage you to check in with yourself and say, what changes are occurring in my life? And what thoughts and feelings and fears are rising to the surface? And what is my own story? What do I think is about to happen to me? And as we're exploring our stories of fear, sometimes it's good to look at the fear acronyms because believe it or not, as corny as they are, they do a pretty good job of summarizing our emotional reactivity when our fears are triggered. Whether or not anyone else notices will resonate with this in ourselves. So the first acronym, fuck everything and run or false evidence appearing real, or feeling excited and ready, forgetting everything about reality, and my personal favorite, finding excuses and reasons. And I am sure that there is one perfect one for you in there somewhere, whether or not you want to admit it to yourself or not. But I think the reason I'm sharing that is because it is interesting when we break it down that simply as to what fear is doing within us. And, you know, maybe the way we've been looking at fear 
has really been cutting us off from exploring it. So I always like to share that I believe that our fears can be broken down into three categories. We are afraid that we are not enough. We are afraid that we don't have enough or won't get enough. And we are afraid that someone will take something away from us. All of our fears can pretty much fit into these three categories. And of course, they take on different characteristics, but at their core, they always generally seem to fit into one or more of these three. And that can look very differently for each of us. It can be the fear of not being lovable, attractive, or even just enough for other people. We might have this profound fear that we are less than or we are undeserving. And I talked about that a little bit in my imposter syndrome episode, you know, where our fears are making decisions for us and for the other people in our relationships. You know, fears already crafting a story that this person could never really love me. They couldn't really care about me. This is never going to work out. And it directs our behavior before we can even witness any evidence. Similar to that is the fear of being disliked, ostracized, judged, or critiqued. Fear of, anyway, being cut off from the pack. Maybe fears of conflict or uncomfortable emotions. And think about all the things that we do to separate ourselves from unwanted feelings, unwanted thoughts people who inspire things within us that we are not ready to deal with yet. And maybe there's fear of rejection or abandonment. I recently did a whole episode on abandonment issues, and I'm sure that I barely scratched the surface because it's a pretty deep topic. But maybe pausing and thinking, you know, how is my fear of rejection or abandonment, probably something I never talk about with anyone, How is that directing my life? And I think I'm in control. I think I'm making decisions and I'm looking out for myself. But how often am I just sitting in the passenger seat and my fears of rejection and abandonment are running the show? I also want to clarify what it is that I'm talking about here today because I am not talking about valid fears based on the information we have. I'm not talking about our survival instinct. Fear is very informative. There are moments when we experience danger and that fear response saves our lives. Today, I am very specifically talking about the stories that fear is constantly telling us about who we are in the world. The story about other people. The story is about what is going to happen to us. A story of what we think we deserve and who is going to hurt us and what we are about to lose or how intensely we will be punished. Because that's what we are talking about. We are talking about those stories that take root within us that we don't just shake off every time that they rise to the surface. We're not animals. We are animals, but we're not animals. And it can be helpful to actually look at animals, either in the wild or our pets, and see how they process fear and what are we doing differently. Because our animals don't live in a constant state of fear. For the most part, they don't. They shake it off. And that's something that I've spoken about very often in even the yoga classes that I would lead, and some of you who listen may remember, just looking at animals and how they respond after a fearful interaction, after they've encountered danger, been in a physical altercation, whether that's dogs fighting at the dog run, or if that's animals in the wild who narrowly escape death, what do they do the moment? That they know that they're safe. They immediately start to shake and twitch and almost dance it out. And if you've watched animals, you've seen them do this, and it just seems like a natural instinct. 
And what they're doing is expressing the fight or flight responses that wanted to happen in the moment that maybe got paused because someone broke it up or paused because they escaped. And so they're shaking it out because they don't want those things to build up in their systems. Obviously, they're not aware of that. Their body is just telling them to just move really quickly and shake all this out and return to a stable state of mind and body. And it's interesting because animals in the wild really don't get traumatized despite experiencing traumatizing things. But think about us as people and how we hold on to these stories and we reference them constantly, not just in moments of danger, but in moments when we're not in danger. And then we begin to respond in the same way. And whether physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally, or energetically, we can't shake it off. These stories that, you know, an animal would move out of their body, we hold on to. And they are pervasive and they take on different forms and they begin to tell us stories in new situations about all the things that could happen to us. Another good question to ask ourselves as we are exploring our own stories of fear is whose voice am I hearing in my head in moments of fear? Who is narrating my story? Do I recognize this voice? Because if we're hearing a story on a loop in our heads that is either beating us up or tearing us down, there is a great chance that it's someone else's voice and I associate it with another person or another experience. And it's something to investigate. You know, it's important to think about how we enter into the world, right? newborns really only have two fears intrinsic to them. They fear loud noises and they fear falling. But by the end of their very first year of life, they can begin to interpret signs of danger and fear. So every fear that we stack on ourselves after that first year is something that we've experienced in our environment, that we misinterpret, that we sort of catalog in our brains and maybe take out at inappropriate moments. So I want to invite each of us to maybe take a step back and think of ourselves that way. Think of ourselves in the way that we came into this world, pure. We had fears of just the two basic survival things. A loud noise is going to harm us and falling is going to harm us. But what stories have we stacked on top of ourselves since then of what is going to harm or destroy us? And what stories are these fears telling us about our relationships with other people, whether that's our family, our friends, at work, or our partnerships? What is your story about love and relationships? And how much fear is woven into that? And are we afraid of being seen or known by other people? What story do we tell ourselves about that, about who we really are? about what it would be like if someone else really knew us, about how they would feel about us if we loved them or they loved us. Like, what would that do to each of us? What's the story? And what evidence supports that? And have they done or said anything that makes us think it's going to turn out this way? Or is it just the fear loop in our minds? I always think about this one Miranda July quote um, from one of her short stories, Um, and it goes like this. Finally, in a low whisper, he said, I think I might be a terrible person. For a split second, I believed him. I thought he was about to confess a crime, maybe a murder. Then I realized that we all think we might be terrible people, but we only reveal this before asking someone to love us. It's kind of an undressing. And that's something to look at. How often do we mistakenly believe 
that we are the only ones telling ourselves these harmful stories. And what would it be like if every single time we started hearing the story in our head, we sort of paused and remember that other people are experiencing the exact same thing? What would that do for the empathy between us? I did a few episodes on adult children of alcoholics. I actually did three episodes. And I know from my own work and the work that I've done in that community that one of the most difficult stories for adult children of alcoholics is if I don't know what is happening, then something must be wrong. If I don't have the solution, then I must be doomed. If I can't control this situation, then it must be completely out of control. And I think about that so much because obviously I'm an adult child of an alcoholic and these things come up for me all the time. These stories centered around control. You know, I don't think that I'm a controlling person of other people, but in situations when I feel that something's out of control, what is the story that I'm telling myself? And can I move through it? You know, that's the invitation. It's not shaming ourselves for having those initial stories because honestly, those stories are rooted in some pretty horrific experiences. I had very out of control experiences as a child where if I wasn't the one taking care of it, something terrible was about to happen to me. But now as an adult, how do I constantly reference those stories immediately without taking into account all of the resources that I currently have as an adult. So that's the point of work. It's not about shaming ourselves for the thought or the feeling. It's almost um, about acceptance and invitation and saying, you know, tell me that story. I'll listen. Tell me your story of fear. I will pause and I will sit with you through that. But then we have to move into the next story. And that is the story of our agency, our resources, and our ability to, you know, sit in the moment and witness without distorted perception. And on that note, what if we told ourselves a new story? What if that was our devotional practice to ourselves and we committed to it? And it wasn't just something we did, you know, if it was convenient or if we had time, but every single time one of those fear-based stories rose to the surface within us and started directing our thoughts and our feelings and our behavior, what if we paused and committed to telling ourselves a new story? What would be the plot? Who would be part of the cast of this new story? Whose voice would we hear narrating this new story that doesn't center around fear? What would that person be telling us? What would they be encouraging us to do? What resources within our lives would they be calling on? Which people in our lives would that voice be pointing us to and saying, no, I know you have this horrible thought, but what about this person? What about this experience? What about what they've said to you or shared with you or what you've shared together? And the purpose of doing something like this, of consistently committing to telling a new story, is because we have to pay attention to what do our stories stop us from doing, from achieving, or feeling? So what is my story of fear actually doing? Is it limiting me? Is it cutting me off? Is it reducing my options and opportunities and telling me that this is controlling the outcomes? This is protecting me from ever having to fail or be hurt or be harmed or be left ever again. And so I don't think in just one moment of doing this work that we have this aha moment. And I know that pop psychology is just overflowing with that. 
people telling you that they have the the one time answer that you're going to do this one thing and you'll never have this experience again. I don't know about that. I mean, I'm not trying to discount anyone else's process. I don't know about that. I know what I've seen in my work with other people. I know what has worked with me, and I know that repeated exposure to these experiences and relationships and my commitment to changing my own story and calling upon my resources, whether those are new emotional tools or coping methods, that is what helps me. And it doesn't go perfectly the first time or the hundredth time. (laughs) So, you know, plot twist, it can be messy and uncomfortable and we cannot do it perfectly. And We don't always get what we want. You know, my story in this episode is not, oh, just get rid of fear and everything's going to work out. Hello, if you know me in real life, (laughs) you know that I have quite the opposite story and I'm still here. I'm fine. I survived. And what I do know is that every time I engage in these practices and take a contrary action and pause my story of fear, and invite a new story and do call on those resources and say, all right, you know, I'm, I don't trust it, but I'm going to give it a shot. That brings me closer to a feeling of safety within myself and within my place in the world and the universe. And so that's what this is about. You know, I've said it a few times in this episode. It's not about shame and blame and saying, why are you telling yourself that story? You're wrong. No, maybe maybe those stories originate in something really harmful to you, something really true that altered your life. Those things have happened to me, and I understand them. I'm talking about this today because I don't think that that's the period at the end of our story. I feel like our stories continue long after those moments that we think will end us. And I don't want to give up on the next 20 chapters of our stories because we had one really bad chapter. At the beginning of this episode, I talked about, you know, why I even started this podcast and the whole purpose of it. And I think about that and how often I personally felt shamed over my own stories and my own fears. And I felt like I could never talk about it with another person. And so much of my work in the last 20 years has been cultivating those spaces where we as people, not even as professionals, but just as compassionate human beings can contain these stories and love each other through them. And it can sound so corny of like, oh yeah, that's what you do. (laughs) I totally get it. Um, But That's the purpose of this. It's not about pathologizing anyone or giving someone a diagnosis. It's about tapping into our common human experience and saying, when I have a little bit better understanding of what's going on with me and I have tools that I can put into action in those critical moments, maybe I can be of service to you and I can extend that compassion and understanding to the person next to me. Instead of walking around in a constant state of reactivity and cutting myself off from relationships, I can open up and expand and invite more in. And I may be shocked at my own capacity for understanding, for listening, for tolerating moments of discomfort. You know, that's something I always encourage whenever I work with newcomers in any 12-step program. It's the last thing they want to do, and I'm sure it's the last thing I wanted to do when I was new, but I always encourage just sit with things five seconds longer than you are comfortable with. And I'm not talking about harmful experiences, so don't misinterpret it. I'm talking about those moments of intimacy when we want to pull ourselves out because it just triggers something in us or we're afraid of what's about to happen, just sit with it for five seconds longer when someone's looking at you and telling you something and like you're having a moment and you instinctively want to make a sarcastic comment or break the focus in some way. You don't have to sit there for five minutes, five seconds longer than you believe that you can possibly exist in that moment. 
and see what's on the other side of that and explore your own story around fear of like, is this moment going to kill me? Is this moment of truth and vulnerability and intimacy going to destroy me? Or is this person going to see something in me that I don't want them to see because then they'll have the goods, like they'll have the information on me and I can't let that happen. I can't let anyone in. And as we begin to do that with people that we feel pretty safe with, we can build our tolerance and our emotional muscles and begin to do that in other areas of our lives. What a blessing, you know, the thing we don't want, the thing we don't see coming, developing these tools and this tolerance. And I wanted to now move into sharing a tool with you that I use very often in my own life and that I've spoken about in workshops that I've led or the support groups that I facilitated. I think I've even mentioned it in some of my yoga workshops. And that is the acronym RAIN. And it was initially developed by Michelle McDonald, and it's very much part of the mindfulness movement. And then it's been adapted by other practitioners, even Tara Brock, who I talk about on this podcast a lot. I I love her work. Um, And by no means did this type of work begin and end with these people. I'm sure that people have been doing this since time began, but they sort of categorized it into this very accessible acronym of RAIN. And Michelle McDonald said that RAIN is recognize, accept, investigate, and non-identity. And Tara Brock has altered that just a little bit, and her N is actually nurture. And RAIN can be accessed in almost any place or situation or dynamic, and we use this to direct our attention in a clear, systemic way that cuts through our confusion and our stress. The steps of RAIN offer us something to do in these painful moments and then as we regularly weave them into our practice it becomes that muscle memory that we tap into instead of immediately going to our story of fear we begin to come home to ourselves and these new muscles we've developed so let's explore rain for a moment the recognition phase and what is that we are recognizing what is true to our inner life. And it begins the moment that we focus our attention on whatever thoughts, emotions, feelings, or sensations are coming up for us in the moment. And as we begin to settle our attention, we discover that some parts of our experience are easier to connect with than others. Maybe we identify our anxiety immediately. But if we go a little bit deeper and explore those worried thoughts, maybe we'll begin to notice the actual sensations in our physical body that we would regularly ignore. So that's what the recognition is doing. It's saying, yes, I'm hearing this one thing, but I'm going to go a little bit deeper. And it's telling us what is happening inside of me right now. What is happening outside of me? So in this way, recognition is almost an invitation. You know, just think to yourself, how often do you say, oh, I'm just stressed? And like that shuts the conversation down. But there's so much more happening behind the scenes. And that's what the recognition phase is inviting us to do. It's inviting us to look into those places that the entire world is telling us, oh, you don't need to look at that. And it's saying, no, it's safe. Look at that. It's informative. And the next step is the acceptance or allowance stage of RAIN. And that means just letting the thoughts, emotions, feelings, or sensations just be. And we may experience a natural sense of aversion, of wishing that we didn't feel this way. But as we become willing to be present with what is, a different quality of attention will emerge. Allowing is intrinsic to healing, and realizing this can give rise to a conscious intention to just let something be. The main idea is that we recognize the difficult emotions that we're experiencing right now, 
and that they're forming our reality and that it shouldn't be pushed under the surface or suffocated or left to fester until they pop up in some other area of our life. But instead, we allow these emotions to be front and center and we accept and we sit with them and we say, yes, this is how I'm feeling without attempting to immediately change it or block it or numb it. And there is a lot of unpleasantness that comes along with this stage. And so it's an invitation as well to just be kind with ourselves and not to immediately jump into the stage of being a critic. Like we can just be with and accept ourselves. And the next stage of RAIN is investigating with kindness. And Tara Brock says that investigation means calling on your natural interest, the desire to know truth, and directing a more focused attention to your present experience. Simply pausing to ask, what is happening inside of me, might initiate recognition. But with investigation, we engage in a more active and pointed kind of inquiry. We might ask ourselves, what most wants my attention? How am I experiencing this in my body? Or what am I believing? Or what does this feeling want from me? We might contact sensations of hollowness or shakiness and then find a sense of unworthiness and shame buried in these feelings. And unless they're brought into consciousness, these beliefs and emotions will control our experience and perpetuate our identification with a limited and deficient self. So in order for investigation to be healing and freeing, which is what we want, we need to approach our experience with an intimate quality of attention. We need to offer a gentle welcome to whatever surfaces. And this is why we use the phrase, investigate with kindness. Without this heart energy, investigation cannot penetrate. There's not enough safety and openness for real contact. And the last part of RAIN that Tara Brock references is nurture with self-compassion. And I really align with this. I do believe that nurturing is such an important quality in our relationship with ourselves and others. And she says that self-compassion begins to naturally arise in the moments that you recognize that you are suffering. It comes into fullness as you intentionally nurture your inner life with self-care. To do this, try to sense what the wounded, frightened, or hurting place inside of you most needs. And then offer some gesture of active care that might address this need. You know, what do I need in these moments? Do I need a message of reassurance or a little bit of forgiveness? What about companionship, love? And so in doing this, we experiment and we see which intentional gesture of kindness most helps to comfort, soften, or open our heart. And it's not the same for everyone. What works for me, what I do during meditation, I always sit there in my daily meditation and I place my hands on my heart or my solar plexus and I send love to myself because it's the thing that I'm missing, that self-forgiveness, that self-love, that feeling of being nurtured and held. I don't have that. And so I have to create that within myself. So it's about you sitting and saying, what would make me feel most nurtured in this moment? And have I been offering that to myself or have I been cutting myself off from that? And how can I create that in a daily practice? So I invite you to do a little more research. Tara Brock has an amazing podcast. She has tons of material online. She talks about using RAIN in our daily practice all the time. So I really encourage you to look into her work. It might resonate with you. And I by no means have all the answers. I am so transparent. This is work that I do in my own life. It's work I do in my relationships. I myself practice RAIN all the time because I really do need it. But if you have any questions or thoughts, my DMs are always open 
you know, you can share your own experience and maybe I can direct you to some resources that might be able to help you as you begin to implement these practices into your own life. And I wanted to close out this week's episode with a beautiful quote by Terence McKenna that always helps me to take a heroic dose of willingness or surrender, acceptance or self-love when I'm struggling with my own fear-based stories. And I really hope it resonates for you. He says, nature loves courage. You make the commitment and nature will respond to that commitment by removing impossible obstacles. Dream the impossible dream, and the world will not grind you under. It will lift you up. This is the trick. This is what all these teachers and philosophers who really counted, who really touched the alchemical gold, this is what they understood. This is the shamanic dance in the waterfall. This is how magic is done, by hurling yourself into the abyss and discovering it's a feather bed. And until next week, make sure to hit the follow button on your favorite podcast listening platform. Check out this week's playlist on my personal Spotify account and join me on Instagram at Love Letters and Mixtapes. And if you enjoyed this episode, please consider making a small monthly donation to support this podcast by clicking the link in my Instagram bio.